Fans, we are back live with another edition of the Cheap Heat Productions Pro Wrestling Podcast. My name is Jack Kilby, Executive Vice President of Great North Wrestling. We have a very special guest tonight, a man who throughout an almost 30-year career in the business was a, a rather ubiquitous or constant presence on major federation television. He made his mark in the AWA, Mid-South, Kansas Territory and the WWF, I would be talking about none other than Mr. Tom Rocky Stone. But before we get to Tom, as per usual and custom, I have to introduce the man, Mr. Cheap Pete himself, to his own show, and that would be Morris Shortall. Morris, welcome. Thank you, Tom. This is not a not an arrogance thing on my behalf. It's just that Jack has better broadband than me, so we stream via Canada, into Ireland, back to the States, and wherever we go across the world. And I'd like to thank you for coming on today. It's my pleasure. Well, Tom, I'd like to start off with uh, when we do a career deep dive, it's it's always uh, good to give the fans a baseline to ask whether or not you were a fan of the wrestling business growing up, and if so, what were the territories or companies that that uh, you followed that inspired you to pursue wrestling as a career? Well, I didn't actually learn about wrestling until I was in high school, and my dad became the ring announcer for Vern Gagne in Milwaukee, Green Bay, and Rockford. So I started getting free tickets, and I started watching the Saturday night shows, and initially. I became a heel fan. I would be at the matches wearing a Nick and Ray t-shirt to tick off all of the Crusher fans. <laughs> and so I became a heel. Then I became a uh, the timekeeper and bell keeper with my dad. And I did that for a while. And I thought, boy, it really looks neat. I want to become a, uh, hang on, it's Jake Milliman calling me. Let me turn him off. The milk anyway, race. so I wanted to become a wrestler because it looked neat. The guy's flying into Milwaukee every three weeks, and I got to know him a little as the timekeeper, you know, when my dad would talk to him. So I was friends with Nick and Ray before I ever became a wrestler and found out soon after that it really was a lot of time sitting in a car driving 300, 400 miles for a 10-minute match. It wasn't quite as glamorous, but the 10 minutes in the ring was worth it. You know, mm -hmm. so that's kind of where I – and when I was in college, I worked as a security guard, and Frank Hill worked at the telephone company driving truck. Frank became Jules Strongbow. And so we became friends. He was trying to get in the business. And when I started working locally, somehow we reconnected. I don't remember how. And he's the one who actually got me booked for my first matches in St. Louis and then Minneapolis and then Kansas City. Can, can you talk about uh, how your training process uh, was executed and and who you were uh, mainly trained by? Okay. Uh, when I was in college, a buddy of mine, this is, I really wasn't a wrestler yet. He were, he did this little program on wrestling down at U University of Milwaukee, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. It was a joke thing, but I went and met him after. His name was Ned Wicker, and he became my wrestling brother. And he said, well, I know guys who run a show on the south side of Milwaukee. So we went down there and tried out, kind of, and he got me on a show there. And by the third time, by the third show, I was already booking the cards wow. <laughs> without really any training. And then I started training with Frank Hill, Jules Strongbow, and Dick Reynolds. I don't know if you remember Dick. He did a lot of TV stuff. He was a school teacher in New Berlin. And during the summers, he would go wrestle in Texas and that. So I trained with them. Uh, then I decided I wanted to go to a real school. So I went to Lou Klein's wrestling school 
outside of Michigan, outside of Detroit. And I stayed there like three weeks. I think I paid 500 bucks living in the gym. But they were gone all week. And he'd come back on Tuesday morning, and he'd teach me a headlock. And then they'd leave Wednesday, and I wouldn't see him again. So after three weeks, I packed up and came home. And basically, I trained myself mm. along with Frank. But you really don't learn it until you start driving in the cars with the old timers. Mm -hmm. So when I got to Kansas City is when I started getting a clue on how to lead a match. And then I went to Louisiana and I stayed in an apartment com complex with Frenchie Martin and Bull Ramos. And Frenchie Martin was a great wrestling mind. And so he taught me how to go out in front of a crowd and find out what they wanted to see and give it to them, you know? So that's really how I learned. So when I came back from Louisiana is when I had a pretty good understanding of how it all worked. Tom, you, you mentioned that your, your father was a ring announcer. How much yep. did he smarten you up to the business before you actually Vern, went in? Vern never like smartened him up. Vern didn't oh, smart never anyone did. up. No. Okay. And when I first went to work for them, Wally changed my name to Rock to Tom Stone. He didn't want Vern to know my dad was the ring announcer. Okay. So I don't know if Vern finally knew that or whatever. He never said a word to me. But Vern didn't smarten anybody up. And neither did I back then. Even though I was getting beat on TV, you go to work and say, hey, these guys are Olympic athletes. They're better than I am. Which is why I can't stand today's wrestling. Because <laughs> none of the most we of the kids today, the most of the kids today, they couldn't have gotten a ring back then. Can you imagine that kid on AEW? I think his name is Orange Cassidy. Who puts his hands in his pockets? Can you imagine doing that in front of Harley Race? You wouldn't have got out of the building alive. Or Bruiser Brody, <laughs> you wouldn't have got out of the ring alive. For sure. How how uh, did you? Uh, that was one of the the next questions that I had for you. Was how did you first get? To, it's a two parter. How did you first uh, get to work for uh, Vern in the AWA? And I know you wrestled him on television quite. Uh, early on in the, the late actually, 70s. Yeah. It was uh, actually my first match on AWA TV. Was it was the only match. time Greg and Vern teamed up on TV. Mm. So, and then I think my third match on TV was against Vern himself. And that's just, you know, you go up for TV and they say, okay, Stone and Herman Schaefer, you're wrestling Greg and Vern. Did and you I, find that experience intimidating, given the fact that he was Vern Gagne and, and Greg Gagne? No, not at all. I, I had already got the crap beat out of me in St. Louis by two little kids, Gary Young and Dan Diamond. And I don't know if you know that St. Louis ring on TV was as hard as the concrete outside. And they must have given me 20 body slams and 15 backdrops, and they walked away from holds. And I was beat up so bad. I'd never been hurt that bad. And they were tear trying to get me to quit. And then after they beat me up, I went back up in the room and Pat O'Connor says, next tape you have Bruiser Brody. Well, I'd never met Bruiser Brody. And this is before he had gallbladder surgery. So he was like 320 pounds. And the first thing he said to me was, let me thank you now in case I can't thank you afterwards. Well, I just got beat up by two little guys. And now I got Brody, and Frank was fine. The only thing he did, he dropped me throat first in the top rope, and I didn't know how to take it. So I took it with my throat, which could have been bad. It didn't. It was okay. But uh, so when I went to Minneapolis, that was a piece of cake with Vern mm -hmm. and Greg compared to uh, Brody and the kids in St. Louis. 
you had so many notable opponents in in the AWA. I, I just wanted to ask you about uh, a couple that that jump out. You, you mentioned uh, earlier on that you were a fan of of the heels, and uh, I noted that you you wrestled uh, Patterson and Bockwinkle in tags on TV and Bockwinkle a couple times as a as a single. Do you, do you remember? Uh, their their style in the ring and what it, what it was like to mix it up with uh, you know quite renowned workers. Well, Nick, I got like I said, I got along good with Nick. So when we worked, he would let me cover him and get two counts on him on TV. Uh, he, he was stiff. I mean, when he he was probably the stiffest of all the guys. Where Ray Stevens was as light as a feather. Nick was not light, but Nick was fun to work with because he would do what you wanted to do. Nick was funny. When you'd sit down with Nick and say, what do you want to do? He'd say, well, if this happens, let's do this. And he'd go through a long list of stuff, and we never did any of it. But we always Mm -hmm. did the finish on his the way I wanted to do it. Now, I was lucky. I got to work Pat Patterson in a sold-out show with closed circuit TV. And that was a real, that was great fun to get Pat, who was one of my heroes, you know, in front of 16,000 people and to wrestle one of your heroes. In fact, that night or the day before that, a girl who we had trained and sent to Moolah had broke her neck and was paralyzed from the waist down. And I drove to Mini that day with Jake Milliman and I said, I'm not taking any bumps. So when I got there, they said, you're working with Pat. So <laughs> I kind of took all the bumps that we needed to take. But Pat was a trip to work with. Uh, everyone knows Pat was gay. And we're getting the instructions from the referee. And he goes, uh, kid, just remember, if I get behind you, you're fucked. <laughs> and then I was a baby face for that match. And I'm making my comeback, and he's on his knees going, kiss me on the lips, Mary. <laughs> so, I mean, it was. That was his yeah. idea of ribbing, correct? Yes. But, I mean, I worked with, you know, guys like Martel, and and I worked with these guys in house shows, and Baron, and Dr. D, and Bobby Heenan, and so Jerry Blackwell. I wrestled all of the guys in the AWA almost. Yeah. What about Jesse Ventura? I, I know you did a, I never a wrestled Jesse. No. No, I never got to wrestle Jesse. Because hmm. I was usually the heel on TV. So if you have that written down somewhere, I never did. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. But we Jesse, got we got lots of we got lots of sorry, Tom, we got a, lots of misinformation on this. Well, there was another promotion. I mean, I I know. WCW used some guy and they called him Tom Stone. And I know someone else used Steve Hall somewhere, which is what I was called in Kansas City in Mid South. So it was a rib. It was part of the business. Yeah, we looked up a photo of of you in WCW earlier, and it was quite clear that it wasn't you against it Steve wasn't. Austin. Never, so that's never worked there. Came. Yeah. What, what about the, the brain? You mentioned wrestling. Bobby Heenan, who, of course, is probably the greatest uh, manager of all time, certainly top one or two. Well, if you uh, talk to Nick, he was the greatest wrestler of all time because yeah, he, could re- he could replace anybody and no one would want their money back, right? If it was Nick and Ray in the tag team championship and one of them didn't show and Bobby took his place, nobody asked for the money back. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I wrestled Bobby one night in Sheboygan. Uh, no, maybe it was Fond du Lac. And he, uh, all the big bumps he took, he did not know how to get taken down by the hair. Because, you know, he got a top wrist lock on me. And I, as a heel, I took him down by the hair. He didn't know that all he did was sit down. He didn't know how to do it. <laughs> but but Bobby, it was a- Bobby was a, uh, I, I like Bobby. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting that he was he was that uh, versatile uh, with with respect to his his talents, but his uh, abilities in the ring are, are not as trumpeted, given the fact that he was you know the manager in the in the WWF for 
a long time. Before I, I tag over to, to Morris, I wanted to ask you about your your time in the AWA wrestling Hulk Hogan uh, several times, both uh, in two-on-one handicaps and a single or two, if the information's correct. Wrestled him several times. Uh, Hulk and I were friends. In fact, I stayed at his house a couple of times when I had to fly back to Milwaukee to go to work on Monday morning if I stayed over for TV. But Hulk had a nasty habit when he beat you. He'd cover you with his crotch in your face. So I kind of bit down on his balls a little. <laughs> and let him know that while he was posing, he was not in control of the moment. But... Terry was fine. He was a good guy to me. Now, I hear all the people who don't like him in the business, but I think that was more jealousy that he was on top for so long. And I got along good with him because he knew I was no threat to his position. What do you think about Vern's steadfast refusal to put the the belt on him and all the dusty style finishes where he apparently went over on Bockwinkle. And then some who say that uh, if Vern would have pulled the trigger on him, made him champion, there wouldn't have been uh, that Vince McMahon national expansion, at least not at that time. Yeah, there probably wouldn't have been, but it would, it wouldn't have stopped Vince. Vince would have just offered him so much money that he would have left anyways. Because what Vern didn't give him that Vince gave him was a part of the concessions. You know, he got a lot from all the stuff that WWF was selling, and Vern wouldn't do that. And Vern, he wasn't ready for the business to go the way WWF was taking it. Because when you look, almost every guy who worked for Vern was either a high school the worst they were was a high school wrestler or they played college football or they were Olympic athletes. And I wish I had realized that before I decided to go out on the road full time because unless I was could become a manager somewhere, it was when the business was becoming all the Hulk Hogan's and Paul Orndorff's and a guy like me was never going to get a chance to draw money. Mm. But I don't think he could have stopped because Vern's territory, like a lot of them, was aging out. Yeah. You know, you had Vern at 55, Crusher at 60, Nick was 45 or 50, uh, Mad Dog was 50. So all his top guys were old. They never got any of the young guys really over to draw money. Do you know why he absolutely refused to uh, put the belt on on Hogan? Were you privy to that information? I, I just point? don't think he wanted he wanted legit wrestlers to have the belt. Hmm. I don't think you know Hulk had great theory, but what did he do other than a leg drop and a cover? Right? He didn't have a he didn't have the wrestling background and. Vern wanted a guy who was an Olympic wrestler, you know. He didn't want a non – and he was afraid putting the belt on Hogan, if Vince comes and writes him a check for a hundred grand, and he packs up in the middle of the night, there's his terror. His terror, he had to trust the guy who had the belt. Mm. And that came back and bit him with Stan Hansen. Mm-hmm. Speaking of biting, Tom, I want to know what Hulk said after you bit his balls. He never said a word to me. I mean, really? I bit down enough that he knew my teeth were there. Yeah. But not enough that he would actually feel it. He never said a word to me about it. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. I always ask people, Tom, like from being in the business so long, like what kind of condition is your body in now from all those years of being in the ring? Uh, my hips are bad. My back is bad. Uh, I don't walk real steady anymore, but I haven't had any major surgeries. 
I mean, I lost a couple of toes a couple of months ago, but that was the diabetes, not okay. to, but I think that was from drinking all the sodas on the road trips. But other, I mean, I'm okay, I guess. I mean, I couldn't get in the ring anymore. I couldn't fall because yeah. I couldn't get up. And do you have any involvement in any wrestling promotions at the moment, either in a managerial or any kind of role? No, there's a guy locally, Frank DeFalco, who runs Brew City Wrestling. And I once in a while go down to his camp where he trains people. But most of the guys are 140 pounds. And it's guys who don't know how to wrestle training other guys who don't know how to wrestle. I mean... And they look at me when I try to tell them something like, what the hell are you talking about? Mm. You know, because I was trying to think how I would do a high spot today. Because you can't teach them headlock, one tackle, drop down, hip toss, get it again. So I came up with a whole new way to do high spots. And they all look at me like, you're out of your mind. So I, I don't get today's. I don't get today's wrestling. Entertainment business, Tom. That's what it is. People know it's a work, and you can have guys 140 pounds being a professional wrestler. Why would you pay money to see that? Well, so back it, in the day, you were paying to see Harley Race, tough guy. Haku, tough guy. Uh, Olympic athletes. <laughs> guys you wouldn't mess with. Today... Most of the fans can beat up most of the guys. I, I don't understand why you would pay $15 a ticket to go sit at those matches. It, it's funny you mention that because that's that's one of the the areas that, that I often comment on is, you know, you know what happened to the larger-than-life, legit tough guys. I remember back in the day, if you were 220, you were small, and uh, now you've got 180-pounders, et cetera, uh, pliant, you know, doing their thing. So I guess it's just uh, it's just a, a major change that's hard to to get used to if you um, you know come from that uh, that eighties golden era. Speaking of which, in um, first in Keel in Kansas City, you shared the ring in a battle royal with the the late great Andre the Giant, and then again in the AWA, at least according to the the research. What uh, was Andre like to uh, be in the ring with and also around if you had any contact with him? Well, I don't remember the match in Keel, but I did. He was in a battle royal that I was in in Chicago at the amphitheater. And I was it was my first house show. And I was the last guy introduced. And as I rolled into the ring, Angela Mosca attacked me. And Andre came over and saved me and put Angie in the corner. And I started hitting Angie, and he was just yelling, lighten up, kid, lighten up, because I must, my adrenaline must have been going because I was hitting him for real. Andre, I mean, I knew him. He called me boss. He called everybody boss. But I didn't know him to go out drinking with him or anything. Because when I was a part-time guy, I didn't go to the bars with the guys because I didn't think it was right. I thought it was a fraternity because I'd done it full time for a year and a half. And I didn't want to intrude on their parade. And they all said, you can come down. You know, they didn't care. But I just felt felt wrong. So I, I never actually sat at a bar with Andre and You also had uh, quite uh, a, a run in uh, Mid South Wrestling. Just wanted to to get your memories of of working that territory and its very extensive drives, and uh, the Cowboy Bill Watts working for for him. How did that come together? Well, I was in Kansas City, and they changed bookers. And when they changed bookers, Jody Hamilton brought in his own crew, and he got me booked in Mid South. Now, at the time, Mid-South was not running the Oklahoma end. We were okay. only doing Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, I got there on a Friday night. My first match was with Jerry Oates. I've never, to this day, I've never met him outside the ring because the dressing rooms were on opposite sides of the building. See if the kids today could do it. 
And the next day after the match, I would I stayed at Jake Roberts' house that night. And he said, you know, they were going to fire you last night. They were going to give me one match to prove myself. Watts, Robley, and Grizzly Smith. And luckily I had a decent match. I led the whole match. So I had a good match, so they kept me. And then early on I was either wrestling Jake or Brutus the Barber Beefcake, who was Dizzy Ed Golden at the time. And at the time, he was so clumsy. He would fall down. He had no balance. He And Buck would always say, get as much time as you can with him. Do whatever you can. Uh, and it paid off later because when I work him in New York and he cut my hair, he just sniffed off a little in the back of me where he'd shave other guys wild because we were we were friends you know so i was lucky that way but i spent a lot of time working with jake and uh while i worked with him i heard he had a broken arm and in a month that i worked with him we never rebroke it and the night after tank Patton rebroke it so mm -hmm. i became friends with him so like when i went to new york he wouldn't put the snake on me because I didn't want the snake actually on me. He would hold it. So knowing all those guys was nice. Uh, I got along great with Bill after that. In fact, when I left there, uh, he said, you want to ever come back? Just give me a call. And after the first two months or three months, Wobley booked me as one of the referees in the big towns. So I got New Orleans every week, which was the big payday. Mm -hmm. I wasn't wrestling, but I was refereeing, which I said to Buck, I said, I really don't want a referee. And he said, yes, you do, because I want to pay you. You know, so the other guys who were underneath were working two or three nights a week making 200 bucks. I was working six nights a week making $600. And I got to sit with Buck because I would carry finishes to the town. So I I learned how to put matches together. I learned how to put finishes together. So when I came home, I was running my own territory and was able to put really good finishes together. Uh, the only thing I regret in Mid-South was leaving. Uh, after about eight months, I called Wally up in Minneapolis and said, can I come back and work for the summer? Stan Stacy had got me booked in Portland for the fall. And I got home and I called Wally. I said, I'm back. He says, I'm sorry, we're all full. So I went and got a job selling cars and I basically quit the business. I said, screw this. I didn't go to Portland. And then I was talking to Kansas City, and I was going to go back in as a manager and manage and wrestle, kind of like Heenan, probably not as good, but same thing. And I had a gimmick set up that we had done in Milwaukee where a buddy of mine's daughter was about 16, but she could take, she was an actor, a gymnast, and you could clothesline her. So we were going to, I had already set it up with Geigel. We were going to bring her down on TV and have her give someone a trophy or a plaque or something where I had attacked the guy and then she'd jump on my back and I'd take her and throw her off and clothesline her on TV. Wow. And I think it would have got monumental heat. Mm. But two weeks before I was going to go back down there, the electric company called me and offered me a full-time job with benefits, 401k. And I said, I can't, I, I can't go. I mean, I couldn't pass that up. I was ready to get married at the time. So at that point I was basically done wrestling. And then Jake Milliman, who was booking the TV talent for Vern called me and said, we're going to Vegas. Do you want to go? And I immediately took over for Jake and took over the booking. And then I started. Then Canada, then Terry Garvin called me and said, you want to do 
bring guys to New York. So that was all paying pretty good. And Vern was using me every weekend for spot shows. But Mid-South, there was interesting things. One of my favorite guys I traveled with there was Junkyard Dog. And one night we were in, we got done. I don't remember. We were probably in Greenville or Greenwood. And we he, we were going through Chula, Mississippi. Well, he picked a part of town that no white guy went to. <laughs> and he said, go get us some beers. So I went in and get some beers and sodas. And I turned around and I had six big black guys standing around me. I was a dead man. And he knew it. So he waited just long enough to come in and put his arm around me. And then he had to put up with the piss in my pants the rest <laughs> yeah. of the ride. But he was, I really liked Junkyard Dog. We got along really good. Uh, and we traveled a lot together. And he was a trip. But they had a great territory. And we had DiBiase and we had the Freebirds and JYD and Orendorf. I mean, it was a fun territory, and we were making money. Mm -hmm. But just to show you how the business was at the time, Bill Watts came in on a TV, and he says, we're the only territory in the, in the country making real money. He says, I'm going to raise the minimum pay from 50 bucks to 60 bucks on the bad towns. And 60 bucks a night wasn't great, but it was okay. I mean, back 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Well, unfortunately, the bad towns went up, so you made an extra 20 bucks a week. But New Orleans mysteriously went down 25 bucks. <laughs> so our <laughs> weekly pay actually went down. That's awesome. That's tremendous. You mentioned... Uh, when you went to uh, Las Vegas and uh, a lot of fans, myself included, their introduction to the AWA was from the famous uh, Showboat Sports Pavilion in Vegas and that ESPN contract. And you were, uh, you were all over those tapings uh, working, you know, the Midnight Rockers, Rose and Summers, Kurt Henning, a, a list of who's who and that period of the AWA, and it, it looked for a while that the AWA was, you know, it needed that that national TV. What what do you remember specifically about working for the for, for the AWA at that time? Those those competitors, as well as being in the showboat, which when I went to Las Vegas, I found out was demolished about twenty years ago. Yeah, uh, we didn't stay at the showboat. We stayed across the street. And we actually had a room with like 10 beds in it. So we had all the guys who I, I think I was flying in like eight guys for a show. So we would all stay in that one room. And uh, the talent level was not good at the time. I mean, we they were trying to get guys like Scott Hall, who became a hell of a hand. But I got him in his second match, and I basically chewed him up for 10 minutes and then let him beat me because he had hurt Jake the Milkman the week before up in Minneapolis. So the talent level, we had Leon White who became Vader, but the territory was already, I think, beyond repair. Uh, I enjoyed working Marty and Sean. They were easy. I mean, I worked with them in New York, too. Uh, they were a lot of fun. Vegas was fun. I mean, we went there more. The wrestling was the least of our worries. Uh, <laughs> we were there more to gamble. Uh, but to show you what it was like in Vegas, we got in one night at about 11 o'clock. And I, we went to our room, and I found a spot on the bed, and I laid down just – I was beat at 11 o'clock at night. Well, Jake the Milkman's taking a shower. Well, he comes out of the shower. He doesn't dry off. He doesn't put any clothes on, and he jumps on my bed to wake me up. And I'm getting slapped in the face. 
It was the closest I ever gave, gave went to giving a guy a blowjob. <laughs> his dick was slapping me in the face. <laughs> then we went out partying that night anyways. I mean, Vegas was basically, we didn't sleep while we were there. We just, we went out on the strip and we came back and then you'd have your meeting in the afternoon in Greg's room. Uh, but, but the talent level was already getting pretty bad. Tom, I was just looking at your your WWF run earlier. We'll say from 19, 1987 to 1994 steadily. When you left in 1994, was that anything to do at the time with the big steroid trial and cutbacks in the company? No. Or how did your egg come about? No, that was my kid was eight years old and he was a great baseball player. And I wanted to go to all his games. Okay. So... I mean, the last few years that I went and did TV, I wasn't watching it anymore on TV. And they booked me with, if it was one of the old guys from Mid South or that. But one night I got booked with Red Rooster. And I went up to him and said, I have no idea what you do. Tell me what you want to do out there. And he didn't like me because he told me what he wanted to do. And then he wanted to go over it and over. And I, I kept walking away from him. I said, I got it. You know, and I realized now that he his job was on the line. But at, by that point, I didn't really give a shit. I mean, I was there to collect my paycheck. And I really wanted to be home because when my kid was six, he was already playing with nine year olds for baseball. And when he was Good. eight, he was on traveling teams. So I wanted to be there. I didn't want to wrestle anymore. Could you see the business at that time changing into more of an entertainment product and did that make you lose interest with it also? Yeah, I mean, not really, but it was it was all going to the muscle bone guys, right? Everyone now looked like Ultimate Warrior and Hulk and T uh, Paul Warrendorf. I mean, it was fine, but the wrestling part of it was kind of, the really good workers, they still had guys like DiBiase and Kurt who were great workers. But it, it was the business was changing. And One I was the, getting older. I was by that time, by 94, I mean, I was 40 years old. The thrill was gone. I'd been in front of the big crowds. TV, you don't get to really work and call matches and, you know, try to play the crowd. you got your four or five minutes. And the one night in WWF, I don't remember the year, but we were in Tampa. And I was the on-deck match. It was me and uh, Kerry Von Erich. And the kid in front of us broke his neck. So we're waiting on deck while Flight for Life is trying to take this poor kid and get him out of there and get him to the hospital. And as far as I know, he still is paralyzed from the neck down. You kind of lose your enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, individuals that uh, sort of disappeared for a long time, but then recently came back for an interview or two that fans still talk about, you worked in the AWA as Mr. Magnificent Kevin Kelly, and then, nails in uh, the WWF what uh, was that experience like and can you compare the uh, the two uh, experiences because he had a very different uh, character in the AWA well I had him I had him his very first match in the AWA wow. it was in Milwaukee and we were doing a tag team tournament and it was me and they put me and Brad together for some reason and they had Regal with Kelly and Vern was in town, and Vern said, we haven't smartened him up yet. Don't talk to him in the ring. Now, this is a guy who's 320 pounds, whose muscle on his arm is bigger than I am. And the first thing the Regal went to run my head into his knee while he was out of, in the, out of the, on the apron, and he put it, brought his knee up to meet my head. And he almost knocked me out. Well, I wasn't going to be quiet anymore because I'm not going to get hurt. 
and he was fine. But the only I don't remember working him other than that one time. And like I said, he hadn't even been smartened up yet. Uh, so I don't have much to say about him other than Burns said to me after the match, he says, you weren't talking to him, were you? And I looked at him and, and I didn't lie. I said, I did not say one word to him. And as I turned away, I said, I said a thousand words to him because <laughs> I was not going to get hurt. I mean, that was the one thing, the guys I worked with, the first thing Ray Stevens taught me, he says, I give you my body. It's a fine piece of bone china. You give me your body. It's a fine piece of bone china. Give it back in the same condition you gave it to. And that was changing mm. Mm. as the business, as, as I got farther into the business. You had guys like the Road Warriors who were told in, down in WC, well, it was Georgia at the time. They were told, just beat the hell out of the job guys. So when they came to Minneapolis, I told Greg, I said, I'm not working with them. And they came and we did a show in Hammond, I believe. Eddie Einhorn had bought in. And Hawk was mad. He says, who the hell are you to not work with us? I said, I'm guy with a job on Monday. And then about five years later, I was booked with them in New York. Mm. And I didn't have the pull in New York to pull myself off. And so I went and found Joe, and I said, Joe, you got your chance tonight. He says, ah, shit, you were smart not to work with us back then. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. Mm -hmm. So, but the, the guys didn't care. You had the guys with the powers of pain. They didn't give a shit. Uh, you had Van Vader, didn't give a shit. Uh, there was just too much of that. Was that something that Vern did a lot Uh not smarting guys up when they're uh, about to work a match. I mean, that's... I don't know. That was the only time it ever happened to me. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, there weren't that many guys coming out of the camp that I worked right away when they came out of the camp. So... Tom, do you have any memories of working with, and these would be definitely considered safer and easier wrestlers to work with brett jim and owen hart and the wwf different points uh brett was an ass in my opinion <laughs> brett talks about not hurting people bullshit he pile drove me and almost broke my neck he was not he portrays himself like this guy who was real careful i don't think he was uh I mean, I never had a problem. I mean, the guys like Ray Stevens and Greg Gagne, and I never had a problem. Mad Dog Vashon, I never had a problem with. Uh, I didn't have a problem with too many guys. Vader was, I didn't like working with him. Uh, but Brett, I have no, I don't like Brett at all. I never wrestled Owen. I knew him. I thought he was a decent guy. I had lunch with him once, uh, right, right, probably before he died, and that was kind of bullshit. What again, about I, I came up with guys like Ray Stevens and Pat Patterson, and they cared about you. You know they, yeah, and most of Vern's guys cared about you. That was changing at the end. Did that Brett incident, Tom, happen in WWF? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't know if I worked him more than once or not. But again, he wasn't one of the guys I knew from Mid-South or the AWA. You know, he was a guy I never worked with. And maybe he didn't trust me. I don't know. But he never apologized. And so I don't have any love loss for Bret Hart. He might have been the greatest guy, and he might have protected everyone else, but he didn't protect me. Hmm. One of the uh, the guys that uh, has that reputation of, or did, depending on who you talk to, uh, of being reckless that, that indicates that you wrestled on television was uh, the Ultimate Warrior. Uh, he was, I mean, the match was so short, I only worked him one time. And uh, 
he blew himself up so bad he couldn't press slam me, which ticked him off. But he was he was all right with me. But I know he didn't got hurt by him. And but the matches with the job guys were so quick. You know, he, he didn't do much other than press slam you, and so I didn't have a, I didn't have any problem with. Got a, a question from a, a fan on social media who noted that you were part of the Pro Wrestling USA experiment between the AWA and uh, NWA Jim Crockett promotions and uh, wrestled uh, Rick Martell on uh, one of their uh, television shows. And I'm sure you knew him from, uh, from the AWA in general. Do, do you remember that Pro Wrestling USA uh, experiment and – what what are your thoughts I on Rick Martell? Was, I think that was when Eddie Einhorn was in, but I had worked with Rick. I had his first match in, in when he came into the AWA in Milwaukee. Uh, so Rick was easy and fun. Uh, we were we became good friends. I don't remember working him on TV, but I don't remember half of the TV matches I had. I mean, I see stuff on YouTube now, and I go, I don't remember working with him. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, the one, two, three kid or X Pac said on social media, he called me the greatest job guy of all time. Yep. He said enhancement talent, but I don't like that term because I was a job guy. But I didn't remember ever working him. But it, it's it's on WWF, it's on TV on YouTube, mm -hmm. and now that I know it, it was his first Mark Dark match when he was trying out for them. So, but you don't, you, I don't remember all the guys I worked unless there was something special about the match. Yeah. Did you ever encounter the infamous Vince McMahon Jr. during your tenure in WWF or have any interactions with him? Not really. I mean, I knew him and he was treating me okay. The only real interaction I had is they were doing the King of the Ring deal, and he had my guys that I had brought carrying, and they were practicing before the show, and he had John Studd get on the thing. And he started laughing because Studd was so heavy. And I yelled across the ring. I said, you won't be laughing when you see our work tonight. And all the agents said, you can't say that to Vince. I said, sure I can. What's he going to do, fire me? I mean... So I didn't, I didn't look at him. He was the owner of the company, and I worked for him. But other than that, he was fine. I basically went through Terry Garvin, and then Pat Patterson, who I knew real well, was actually the lead booker at the time. And the TV bookers were Rene Goulet and Tony Gurria, and I knew Rene from the AWA. So I knew all the guys in the office there. During the uh, dying days of the AWA, I, I noted that you were involved in that infamous uh, team challenge series. And uh, a lot of fans remember that for, for the uh, re recorded matches without a, without a crowd in a studio and, the, the great uh, turkey on a pole match that was won by uh, Jake Milliman there. Do you, do you remember taking part in that? And what were your thoughts uh, in terms of the the new concept by uh, Vern that, that kind of reeked of desperation? It was, it was stupid. And we had the team and, you know, we do interviews. And I was a heel and Sarge was a baby face and I was on Sarge's team. So even in a match, if we did a battle royal or something, I would attack my own guy. No one ever told me not to. No one told me what to do. It's like I had never worked a three-way match, right, which is common now. But that turkey on a pole match was me and Jake. And I can't. And the other kid's name, I'll think of it, but I can't think of the other kid's name. But he was out of the camp. He was green. They never told us how to work a six-way match, a three-man match. They just said, go out and do it. 
Well, why wouldn't you have the final be Sarge and Zabisco? Why would you have Jake and me and the other kid? I'm friends with the other kid on Facebook, and I can't think of his name. But we had no idea. No one one told us what to do. And then they were mad at the end because Jake, I don't know, I, I maybe did something to Jake, and he, he jumped up and DDT'd the other kid. But it was like you didn't tell us what you wanted. And Vern was all mad at Jake. I thought the whole concept was stupid, but they were paying me. So as long as you want to write me a check, I'll be there. Another uh, fan social media question was memories of working with the the announcer, Larry Nelson, who uh, is kind of overlooked in, in historical uh, circumstances by some people, but also has uh, some admirers for that, that particular style that he had, especially during the ESPN taping era i don't know if i ever met him oh wow i mean he may have been in the ring when i was in the ring but i don't know if i have ever talked to him gotcha you know the the announcer i remember most and i know gene was roger kent uh because roger would talk about everything wrestling and non-wrestling he talked about burning his mouth on a french fry and when I started watching it, he was doing all the color commentary, and he was still doing it when I was wrestling there. Mm -hmm. You know, and you could hear him, like one night I was working with Adnan, and I went to do a high knee in the corner, and I flipped up over the top rope, and I whizzed by the ring post, and I felt it graze my head. And I was so glad to be alive that I didn't sell it. I jumped in the ring and started beating the hell out of Adnan. And I could hear Rogers talking while I was doing this, going, Stone should land on his head more often. And so the guy I remember is Roger Kent. I really don't remember Larry Nelson. Fair enough. Tom, there's often talk about the WWF Hall of Fame. Uh, some people think it's gimmicky. Some people think it's noteworthy. A lot of people to be asking or suggesting that Barry Horowitz, a guy that you know very well, deserves a spot in that for his contribution to the wrestling business. What do you think about that? Or what do you think about the WWF Hall of Fame in general? I don't care. Uh, I mean, I guess it's something they can promote on their TV show. And I don't know if there's actually a Hall of Fame you can go to. No. No, it's just basically an honor. Yeah, Barry Horowitz should get should get there. But then I think I should too, because I was their best jobber. I think I was every bit as good as Barry. But I mean, if you're gonna put Barry in, then you should put me in. That's never gonna happen, so who the hell cares, right? I mean, for the longest time Ray Stevens wasn't even in it. Someone told me he is, but I don't know if he really is or not. Yeah, he's in a he's in the historical wing. What uh, could you expand a little bit uh, upon your dislike of the term enhancement talent? Because a lot of the guys we speak to don't like the term jobber, but I, I think what we're looking at would be not only Barry Horowitz, but those those guys such as yourself that were so crucial to the product back in the the TV era of creating stars and and the contribution that they contributed getting some formal acknowledgement by by the wwe i think we got our acknowledgement from the top guys the top guys respected us and they showed their gratitude to us you know so i can see the term jobber didn't mean you were losing it meant you were treating it as a job to me, when I quit, when I quit Kansas City and Mid South and came home, and started working at the electric company, to me it was a part-time job, just like working at Seven Eleven. Only instead of making four fifty an hour and working three nights a week, I was driving to do a TV or flying to do a TV match or a house show for some promotion. So it was a job to me. That's why it was called a job. Yes, I was enhancement talent. I didn't consider myself enhancement talent. I was just there 
to do the best I could do. And my job was if I was wrestling you was to make you look the best that I could, you know? And so I knew what my role was, but I never, I mean, when they changed the term to enhancement talent, I thought, why are you trying to make a new word? I you, guess it you, goes along with the life we live today, right? Where all of a sudden someone who's crippled is handicapped or handicapable, I guess it became, right? So they keep changing the terms, right? I was happy. You, being you probably know. You probably know um, Mario Mancini, Tom. He he does be he does be on this show once a yeah, month. I may have known and him. He, I don't he's, know he doesn't like the term. Okay, well, he was he would have been in the same kind of timeline as I you remember the, the name. WWF. I remember the name, but yeah, I don't remember ever talking to him. But he said, he said, I'm not an enhancement talent, I'm not a human Viagra, I'm a jobber. That's what he said. I agree with him. That's tremendous. Yeah. Well, Tom, you've been extremely generous with, with your time tonight. I know we were talking before we came on air, and you wrote a book. That the the title just uh, really really uh, grabs me. Theater of the absurd. Uh, I never wanted to be a big star. Unfortunately, that's that's out of print. You indicated, but why why did you choose that title? And if you had to uh, delineate or boil down your career as a whole, what 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 would be the facet or facets that you're most uh, proud of? Well, I, I'm most proud of the fact that the top guys respected me. And when I worked with, you know, I worked with a Baron Varashki or even a Mad Dog or a Nick. If I was the heel, they let me call the match. Mm. They let me lead because they respected my work. And I could go have a match and they would let me get pinfalls on TV. Uh, I mean, one night I worked with Jim Brunzel and I pile drove him on AWA TV. Vern had a heart attack, but he respected me enough to let me do that because I said, we never look like we're trying to win. We look like we're punching bags. So I think the best thing is, I mean, if you talk to all the guys I worked with, 98% of them respected me. And what, what more can you... You know, when guys who are world champions, and I worked with, I think, 35 guys who were world champions. Wow. And I worked with tough guys who, I worked with Haku one night in Chicago. He beat me with a roll-up rather than a savat kick. He then couldn't believe he was beating me with a roll-up. But he made me look like a star. You know, I worked with Billy Robinson one night in Rockford, and this is when he was a heel. And before we went out, I said to him, Billy, how come you were such a prick when you were a baby face? And I turned and went to the ring. I didn't wait for an answer. Well, he made me look like Billy Robinson that night. I threw him from one corner of the ring to the other. And, I mean, they respected what I did. What more could you ask for? I don't care what the people thought. Most of them don't even remember the job guy, Right. And if they don't remember you, but they remember the guy you put over, you did your job. And as long as the top guys respected that, I was fine with it. Uh, as far as the book, the name, the theater, would be absurd, because that's what it was. It was theater. Nobody understood that. I mean, because in my day, when you would go and work a house show, right, 20% of the people believed it was real. 20% knew it was a work. The other 60%, they go to work on Monday and say, ah, oh, that shit's all fake. But when they were there, they weren't sure. And we had guys who could work with, like, even though I was one of the boys and I knew it was a work, you could watch Billy Robinson and Nick Bockwinkel wrestle and still believe. That's how good they were. Yeah. You know, they were... You'd watch them and you're like, I can't. They got to hate each other. They didn't. They worked all the time. But they were believable. So I just thought it was truly the theater of the absurd. 
I mean, if people knew what we were talking about in the ring, uh, one night, just to show you how absurd it was, we were in Biloxi, Mississippi. It was Terry Latham and Ricky Fields against me and Tank Patton. And Tank had a hold on Ricky, and some fan yelled, hit him, Ricky, hit him. Tank let go of the hold. He walked over to the ropes. He said, listen, I'm the heel. I'll lead the fucking match. He went back and grabbed the hold, and he yelled as loud as he could, hit me, Ricky, hit me. <laughs> I'm in the corner. I'm in tears. Well, that's funny shit. You know, it's like, I don't know if you guys know Buck Zumhoff, right? He was yes, doing sir. a tag with. Bachwinkle and he in somewhere, and Bobby climbed to the second rope, and Nick rolled over and said, shake the rope. Buck shook the tag rope. <laughs> now, Buck, Buck claims that he did that on purpose. I don't think he did. I think he was too stupid to know what to do. But it was truly the theater of the absurd if people knew what was going on. And the fact that you could get people to believe that bullshit. And like I said, 80% of them who were at the matches, at least during the match, believed. So I thought it was... And the, the, the part about not, never wanting to be a big star, I got that line from Danny Morona, who was a comedian in Reno. And it seemed to fit because we all wanted to be a big star. When I didn't get in the business to be a job guy, I got in the business because I wanted to be a big star. But then when I realized that wasn't going to happen, and then when I realized I was better off with a pension and a health insurance and a 401k and a steady job and still be able to go out on the weekend and make three, four hundred dollars doing something I enjoy doing. Yeah, I can claim now that I never wanted to be a big star, but we all wanted to be a big star. There's nobody who got in the business who didn't want to be a big star. Mm -hmm. Very wise. Where can uh, the fans uh, keep up with you on social media? I know you're on uh, Facebook, Tom, but do you have any I'm other on, contact? I'm on Facebook, and my real name is Steve Hall, H-A-L-L. -L. They can find me on there, and maybe the book will be out someday again. I'd like to rewrite it and republish it. I'd like to add some stuff where I talk more about certain wrestlers and what I thought of them. And, you know, because there are guys who I work for, like Buck Robley, who was the booker in Mid South. 95% of the people in this country had never heard of Buck Robley, right? But Buck was one of the best bookers of his time, but nobody's heard of him. Mm -hmm. So, but I'd like to go through and pick out guys I wrestled. Uh, there was a guy down in Louisiana, King Cobra. I think he's still alive. You guys might want to try to find him. And we, we became good friends. But one night we were leaving the building uh, after TV and we were going to La Ranger. And some guy pulled out in front of me. Well, I was an idiot. I yelled, you fucking, and I won't finish the sentence, but King Cobra was a black kid. And after I said it, I went, oh, shit. And I apologized. And to this day, I'd like to talk to him and apologize again because it's bothered me for 45 freaking years. But we, we played it up. We went, we, try my, we went back to my apartment in Baton Rouge because we had like two hours to, to kill. And I said, Cobra, I'm sorry. I only have a front door. So you'll have to come in the front way. And he took it right. He laughed. But I don't know if I heard him. And I, I tried to connect with him on social media because I'd really like to personally apologize one more time because times are so different now. But that's the one regret I have in the business. Out of everything that I did, that's the one regret. 
Well, it's a book that I would certainly enjoy reading and uh, talk about preservation of, of history. That's, that's one of the, the mandates of uh, this channel and, and the interviews that we do is to capture that. If you'd like to read the book, I can send you a PDF version. Amazing. Absolutely. I have a PDF version that I'm rewriting, and I'll send you that. Well, I would greatly appreciate that. And when when you do uh, hopefully get it republished, uh, please, there's there's an open invitation for you to to come back on and, and share more of the stories that, uh, you no doubt, uh, have a, a wealth of. Oh, there's there's a lot more. <laughs> but I, I it's been fun talking to you guys. And hopefully some of the people have enjoyed some of the stories. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they have. But uh, once again, uh, Tom, thank you very much for your time this evening. And we'll, we'll keep in touch and uh, see if we can find uh, King Cobra. Do remember him, of course. And uh, maybe Jake Milliman would uh, be Jake interested. Will not, Jake will not do any podcasts. No. Mick, Mick, Mick Karch has been trying to get him for years. In fact, Jake is right now in the hospital. If anyone, oh. he's oh. got gangrene on his foot too and he's going to lose one toe or maybe more he's been in the hospital all week in fact he's the one who called me while when we first started uh so i feel bad for him uh but he's he does not want to do podcasts because the awa podcast is trying to get him on mm -hmm. a number of times We've we've heard that before, though we can be very convincing here. Uh, the, the, yeah, he's the only way we might get him to do it is if I was on with him. He That's might right. be willing to do that, but whether I could get him to come over here, or whether we could hook up his, I don't know what his computer setup is at his house. Uh, I'll suggest it to him once he gets out of the hospital. But yeah. Well some, something to consider. It sounds like he's got uh, other issues, and we wish him the best in, th in that regard. But uh, well, yes. his issues are much better now than they were a few years ago. He was down to oh, his last someone, couple of days, and he got someone a, in here for you. He got a liver transplant or a kidney transplant from someone who had hepatitis. And okay, well, Brian Costello, I used to wrestle with him. He used, yeah. He's one of Barry Horowitz's. Uh, friends wrestled for him down in Ohio. Uh, he's a great guy and uh, he runs a promotion. He'd be a good guy to talk to. And if you haven't had Barry on, he could hook you up with Barry. We've uh, we've actually had Brian on a couple times, and I've had the over on uh, the Hannibal TV.com had the pleasure of interviewing uh, Mr. Horowitz uh, twice for about an hour and a half each time. So yeah, great, great interview. Much like yourself, we we thank you once again for your time today, Tom. Well, I'm, I'm happy to have been here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Tom. Well, fans, that's it for this edition of the Cheap Heat Productions Pro Wrestling Podcast. If you haven't already, please like this video and subscribe, and you'll keep on top of all the content that we have coming for you. But until next time, take care, everybody.